So that wraps it up for, for me right now. Our next part is an interview that I did this week with a rabbi from Israel. Uh, he has amazing insights uh, into what it's like being there and from a biblical perspective. He does not believe in Jesus as Messiah, but I want you to hear him out and hear where he's coming from and hear what motivates him because he lives on the front lines. He lives with his wife and six children in a farm in what's known as the settlements. He is on 24-7 patrol right now and been since October 7 to guard and protect his family and his community from terror attacks. His name is Jeremy Gimpel, and uh, we'll, we'll play the video for you now. Jeremy Gimpel is a rabbi, a best-selling author, a retired combat sergeant major in the IDF, and an international spokesman for the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. That is a mouthful. A huge welcome to you, Jeremy. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. Uh, it is a privilege. Thank you for giving us a bit of your time. We know you're a busy man right now in this time. Can you give us firstly uh, some insight into uh, why why you have this passion for, for Eres Israel and teaching uh, the, the Bible and its significance to Jews and Christians alike? Well, that's a good question. Why does anyone love what anyone loves? That's a good question. It's like a bit of a mystery. It's like some people love movies and some people love basketball. Um, I've always loved the land of Israel. I don't exactly know why. It's just kind of in me. My grandfather walked from Bialystok to Israel in the early 1900s, in 1916, when he was 15 years old. And I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, because my father that was born in Israel went to study to become a doctor in America. And I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, on the legends of my grandfather at the age of 15, walking for a year and a half to drain the swamps of the north and establish the third commonwealth of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And so I never got to meet my grandfather, but I always sort of sensed that in me is a, a love of the land. And my love of the land also stems and is connected to my love of the Torah. I think that the God of Israel, the land of Israel, the Torah of Israel, they're all really expressions of the same um, idea, the same movement, the same revelation in the world. And so my life revolves around all three of those. Wow. Uh, and, and how has your life changed, though, since October 7 uh, and what happened uh, with the horrible uh, terror attack from Hamas? It's a, that's a really good question. I don't really remember my life before October 7th. It's everything before October 7th is a little bit of a, a haze. It almost feels like another lifetime ago. Um, everything is different now. I'm now on 24 hour guard duty. I walk around now with an, an M16 by me wherever I go. My farm has turned into a military outpost because in the same way that Judea and Samaria is sort of the defensive line for the rest of Israel. The Aru Goat Farm is the defensive line for Judea and Samaria. It's really the first line of defense. And so we're, um, I don't want to say vulnerable, but we're very exposed. And so everything is very tense now. Every day is another drama. Um, soldiers are being killed every day almost in Israel. And many of them are families that I know. And so Israel is such a small country that I don't know any person that isn't directly affected right now uh, by this war. The whole country is in some sort of combined state of mourning, of um, preparation, because it seems as though things are going to get worse before they get better. So everyone right now is just kind of holding their breath and preparing for the worst. Hmm. I, I, I felt in my encounters with uh, with the Jewish community, I felt a sense of sadness that has been overwhelming in terms of what happened on on that day uh, of the seventh of you know the, the the killing of the innocents and what has come out of that. And in the midst of it, you're having to try to find resolve, resolve to keep fighting, resolve to stand your ground. H how do you how do you do that? How do you um, find positive faith in the midst of such a challenging climate? Um, 
it's almost as though faith has been thrust upon us. Mm. We've encountered evil manifest in the world. Um, if you were to imagine a spirit of evil that were to take human form and then be unleashed on the world, so you would imagine barbaric savages going into a peace and music festival and raping the women to death, killing, beheading, kidnapping children, um, really the, the, the worship of their God it is the more gruesome the act, the greater the worship. Because people want to turn this conflict into a political conflict, but they weren't saying free Palestine as they were killing the Jews. They were saying Allah Akbar, calling their God great. And so we're in the midst of a religious war and in the spectrum of spirituality, then we can already really discuss good and evil. And we have encountered manifest evil. And that's what the soldiers of Israel right now are up against. And it's amazing to me because it says that the, you know, as we approach the end of days, there'll be sort of a line drawn in the sand, a separation process between good and evil. And the nations will be divided as well. There'll be a remnant of the nations that stand with good and stand with Israel. And there'll be the nations that most of them turn against Israel. And so we're seeing now that if you stand against Israel today, you are standing on the side of manifest evil. And evil isn't something that can be ignored, because if you ignore evil, it's just a matter of time until it comes after you. So I say this to the people of America that are now calling, for example, for, you know, isolationism. Let's just Israel deal with Israel's problems and America will deal with America's problems. Well, when evil arises in the world, as it did in the 1940s, it attacks the Jew first, but it's just a matter of time until it reached Pearl Harbor. Evil is just a matter of time until it reaches Brisbane and Perth and Sydney and Melbourne. It's just a matter of time. You see the marches in Sydney. They were calling gas the Jews before Israel even retaliated. And so once they're done with the Jews, they're coming for the Australians next. Hmm. Well, th thank you for sharing that, because I think here in Australia, uh, many have wanted to sit on the fence just to be uh, observers and say, well, this doesn't relate to me, but you're making it very personal that it does uh, relate to me and it never stops uh, with Israel as such. And, and you know, the, the sad thing about the Holocaust was that so many did not help, so many did not stand up. Uh, we are doing an event now linked up with International Holocaust Day. And do you feel that there are significant links between the Holocaust and this this attack uh, on Israel, the greatest killing of you know, Jewish lives since, in one day, since the Holocaust? Do you feel there are, there are parallels between these two? Yeah, the one parallel that I think is the most striking is that, you know, for many years, there was sort of a political veil. Maybe this was about politics. Maybe this was about the West Bank. Maybe this was about the settlers. The kibbutzim that were attacked were founded in 1946. There were Jews living in the land of Israel before the state of Israel was ever founded. It had nothing to do with the 67 borders. And those kibbutzim were the most um, peace-loving, coexistence, pro-Arab Jews in all of Israel. They weren't right-wing settlers. And so all of the veils have been removed. Those Jews were killed because they're Jews and no other reason. And so the Holocaust was the same. For some reason, there's a certain mechanism in the world that when spiritual arises in the world, it attacks the Jew first. Um, Isaiah calls us that we are the witnesses of God. Mm -hmm. And as such, we represent God in the world. And so when you see different movements that are anti-Israel or anti-Jewish, in the core, they're really anti-God. And then people get confused. How could it be that these people over here, these left-wing uh, trans activists, are siding with the jihadist Muslims? Like, that? those two don't go together. Uh, if you go a little bit deeper and you realize that at the root of it, it's anti-Jew is anti-God, then everything falls into place. And so that is the parallel between the Holocaust and October 7th. 
It was an attack on the Jews and it was an attack on God. Hmm. Thank you. That, that is so powerful. And in the midst of this, uh, is there hope? Is there hope uh, for our world? Is there hope for the future of Israel? As we see these forces rising uh, against the Jewish people, but also uh, permeating through our nations, uh, sometimes it feels like, you know, we just can't win this battle. Uh, is, there, is there hope for the future of Israel? And is there hope uh, for our world in the midst of this? Israel is the hope. The Jews are the hope of the world. God forbid if Israel were to fall or to be erased, the whole world would fall apart. Hmm. If we are chosen to be a nation that will be the dwelling place for God on earth, as long as the Jews are alive, then there's hope for this world. But I would say not only that, every empire that has come throughout our history, from the pharaohs of Egypt to the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Medes, the Greeks, the Romans, the Ottomans, all of these empires have come and gone, and the Jews are back in the land of Israel. I'm not concerned really about the Hamas. I think that if you think God has brought us this far to allow a bunch of ragtag Muslim terrorists to take us down, no way. And so, of course, there's hope. The flag behind you there, our national anthem is Hatikva, the hope, because deep down, everyone is looking toward this land. It's the most talked about war in the world. The war in the Ukraine is still happening. The economic value of Ukraine far surpasses the economic value of the land of Israel, yet the whole world is captivated with this war because everyone recognizes that the destiny of the world is going to unfold in the land of Israel. And what happens here is ultimately going to affect the world more than the Ukraine or more than any other place on the planet. And so God has chosen this land for his plan to unfold. And miraculously, right now, the dividing line of good and evil between rapists and child butcherers and those who stand with them versus the side of hope, the side of good, the side of truth. And so it's all unfolding. And it is now, I guess, in our hands to choose which side we stand with. A big, big thank you for your time and for sharing with us. Uh, and uh, for our viewers, we're putting the, the website links uh, in this video. And thank you again. And uh, blessings uh, to you, Jeremy, and to the Land of Israel Network. Yeah, so as the website uh, was mentioned there, uh, thelandofisrael.com, I, I, I got a lot out of uh, Jeremy's teaching. I, as we were organizing the event for today, it looked like we didn't have time to include Jeremy. It was a last-minute decision, and he had been busy. He had to cancel on me several times because of security situations. But when we sat down and did this interview, I said, hey, we, we need to hear this. We need to hear this. So I'm glad we, we heard from uh, Rabbi Jeremy Gimpel.